This is the third part of the first lecture, and we'll talk briefly about new frontiers in social psychological research, even though some of them are no longer that new. The first is cross-cultural research. This is research conducted with members of a different culture to see whether the psychological processes of interest are present in both cultures or whether they are specific to a culture in which people were raised. Now, as I mentioned previously, until recently, most psychological research was conducted on Western societies, including samples that were predominantly European American college students. When we were talking about representative samples in surveys, we saw how this can be a potential problem. Now, while that is oftentimes most talked about in surveys, having non-representative samples is a problem for all research dealing with any type of human participant. Thus, it was largely unknown, though assumed, that many of the findings conducted in Western societies could be ported over to other societies across the world. Now, it is important to note that when conducting cross-cultural research, it's not a simply a matter of traveling to some other culture and translating the materials into a local language and replicating that study there, because different cultures can interpret the same phenomena in very different ways. A good example of this is direct eye contact across cultures. Now, a very simple one would be here, it is totally appropriate for someone to spend their time looking at their phone and not look at the person who is their cashier at a supermarket. Even though some of us think it's rude, it is still a dominant and common behavior. Now, if you were to go to Germany, for example, it is considered incredibly rude not to make eye contact with the cashier because, well, they're also a human being. Now, there are more subtle variations of this as well. In certain Eastern cultures, for example, in Japan, it would be inappropriate to look directly into the eyes of one of your respected elders. This is considered very rude. In certain other contexts, direct eye contact can be confrontational. So there are many different ways to interpret it. Just because it is in one way in the culture in which you were raised does not mean that that will hold true across different cultures. And then that can lead to all kinds of biases and prejudices, because remember how I mentioned quite some time ago in this lecture, that it is very hard for us to keep our own preconceived notions from impacting how we examine other people. For example, people who are coming from a culture in which direct eye contact is frowned upon, and they're going into a culture in which direct eye contact is desirable, would have quite a difficult time adjusting, seeing as how they would think everybody is rude while everybody else would think they were rude for not following the cultural norms. Another branch is evolutionary psychology. Now, the evolutionary approach attempts to explain social behavior in terms of genetic factors that have evolved over time according to the principles of natural selection. Natural selection is the concept put forth by Charles Darwin and refers to the process by which heritable, this is things that can be passed on through your genes, so heritable traits that promote survival in a particular environment are passed along to future generations because organisms with those traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. Now, an important point here is that evolution does not have some type of goal. There is not some end point that natural selection is trying to get to. Rather, it is always the case that certain things survive better and pass on more genes, and it is a never-ending dance. To give you a quick and silly example, imagine for a second some birds that live on the roots of mangrove trees. Mangrove trees grow close to the oceans and have these big roots that things can stand on, and they oftentimes eat fish. Now, the level of the ocean slowly decreases over time, increasing the distance that these birds have to reach down to grab their fish, and so birds with longer beaks will tend to get more food, thus be able to mate more and pass on more genes that are perta pertaining to these longer beaks. And over years, let's say the ocean continues to get lower and lower, and so those birds with longer and longer beaks are slowly selected for more and more and more. Now, it is quite possible that at some point in the far future, the ocean level will rise quite drastically. And at that point, all of these birds that have developed these incredibly long and heavy beaks now will not be able to fly away and avoid the flood. Thus, now what will happen is all birds that had shorter beaks and were able to actually fly away will begin to pass on their genes. 
This is actually something very common in evolutionary legacy, where different traits will just oscillate back and forth depending on the context in which they exist. Please note, there is not some directive to evolution. It is, as difficult as it is to understand, a process of chance. It is also important to remember that hypotheses generated through this approach cannot be tested experimentally. You cannot do it. You cannot go back in time and change different types of genes or environmental contexts to our historical ancestors. It is something that cannot be done, as far as our current science would allow us to believe. Just because hypotheses that are derived from evolutionary psychology seem very plausible, right, like a giraffe reaching to the top leaves to get their food, does not mean it is true. In fact, many evolutionary hypotheses seem true due to the fact that all life as we currently know it arose through evolution. Now, answering the question of why is a different matter altogether because we cannot test it experimentally. This is something very important to remember. Finally, there is the branch of social neuroscience. And this is probably the product of social psychologists who had interest, including the study of hormones and behavior of the human immune system, or even the neurological processes of the human brain. Now, there probably also at the same time was a group of neuroscientists who had some interest in social psychology as well, and together this field emerged. Now, common methods used are electroencephalography, or EEG, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRIs. Now, due to the nature of these devices, most experiments using them are conducted in very strict laboratory settings, oftentimes with a person sitting quite still, and having them imagine various scenarios and examining their brains while they're doing so. Now, just for a little bit of background, electroencephalography has people wear a cap, like a speedo swim cap, let's say, and it has little electrodes embedded in it. And this is then hooked up to an amplifier, which allows us to record electrical activity from the brain on the scalp of a human being. And you can look at how different regions are activated and specifically in what time windows they are active and in the way that they do so. Functional magnetic resonance imaging works in a different way. It allows us to get very detailed images of the internal structures of the brain. It does this by applying a very strong magnetic field to the human being who's within the chamber of the functional magnetic resonance imaging device. And then it examines how quickly the various atoms that get aligned to the strong magnetic field fall out of alignment as soon as the magnetic field is turned off. This, if you've ever experienced being in one of these machines, is why there's that incessant, very loud banging sound. It is the electromagnet turning on and off. Further, it has been found that hemoglobin, when it has oxygen bonded to it, hemoglobin is the molecule in our red blood cells that is responsible for fixing oxygen and gives our blood the ability to carry oxygen around the body. When hemoglobin has oxygen bonded to it versus when it does not, they have different magnetic properties. And by looking at this change, one can examine what areas of the brain are actually currently active, hence the functional part of this magnetic resonance imaging. Original MRIs did not have this ability. This allows through the use of blood flow in the brain, not only to look at the structures that are in the brain itself, but also which ones are active. This is why if you've ever seen an fMRI image of a brain, you see a flat slice of the brain with oftentimes red and blue splotches all over it. These are indicators of heightened and lower activity across the brain. Another just fun side fact is through new breakthroughs with EEG technology, or more accurately with amplifier and broadcasting technologies, they are now portable EEG units, which people can put on their head and then walk around with. In fact, there are some long scale studies in which they will glue the electrodes to your head and then you wear them for three days. And this allows for more long term monitoring of the electrical activity in a person's brain. They're still widely expensive though, or wildly expensive. And so they're not used for a lot of common social experiments.